it's good to see you. Today we're doing something a little different. I am here today with Spencer Strickland in his shop and um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, Appalachian music, bluegrass, and making instruments and just all kinds of stuff. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, so just tell us a little bit about yourself, like, um, you know, just a little bit about you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, my name is Spencer Strickland. Um, I build a, acoustic mandolins and guitars for a living. Um, I have done, or I've done so for... Uh, let's see, almost uh, 15 years now, I guess, 14 or 15 years, and <clears throat> I've played music almost all my life. I started playing mandolin when I was um, uh, almost 10 years old, so been been doing that. Music's been a big part of my life, um, you know, ever since I can almost remember. Um, I'm a, a native southwestern Virginia um, uh, guy, and uh, as a uh, and I've grew up in the culture here, you know, pretty much lived here all my life. So, um, I, I learned to build instruments from, uh, Gerald Anderson, who, uh, learned to build from Wayne Henderson. Wayne's probably one of the most famous, uh, instrument makers in my area. He, he has a shop only about an hour from me and a good friend of mine I also play quite a bit of music with him. And so, yeah, I've, um, um excited i i guess i should have started off by saying i'm excited <laughs> for you to be here mary well, and it's, thank you for it's having a me. yeah it's and it's interesting the the way that our paths have crossed and mm -hmm. we have uh um mary's dad is a is a great friend of mine and uh <laughs> this is probably the most time you and i've ever spent together it is so. yeah but he, he actually came and helped me move my washer and dryer i did up a <laughs> lot of stairs i remember was, that that was, it was bad yeah <laughs> like that, Mount Everest to get all yeah. the way up there. Yeah, I still remember. I still remember being on the bottom end of that hand truck pushing that mm -hmm. pushing that dryer up those stairs. But I was yeah. happy to do it for well, you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So your dad actually knows my dad, and you know my dad, and like ev well, everybody here knows my dad. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> he is. Uh, he's quite the uh, staple of the community. Mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah. yeah. He's lived here since 97 yeah and just he loves it up here he's yeah. a he's a super cool guy if um i'm sure you probably a lot of your viewers may or may not know but he is like um just a jack of all trades so mm -hmm. to speak uh, <laughs> like he can make absolutely anything like mm -hmm. like he has a creek running by his house and he built a generator and he like yeah. makes pa makes his own power mm -hmm. for like half his house or something. i mean it's <laughs> it's absolutely amazing the stuff that he can do mm -hmm. and uh yeah, he's a, he's and just a super cool guy too. Re retired military and also he's mm -hmm. a, a pretty cool guy. Yeah, and we we actually have something in common, which is really cool because he's the only person I've ever met who also experiences ASMR, which was so exciting to to find that out. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. And you see, I, I knew you had a channel um, a long time ago because your dad had mentioned it to me. I had no clue what you did though because I never never saw your channel. Um, right. And back around Christmas of, of this year, uh, you shared a video that I yep. that I'd made mm -hmm. of just uh, me playing a, a Christmas song. I think it was "What Child Is This" or something like yep. that. And um, and I was notified that another channel shared one of my videos, uh -huh. and I think you may have been one of the only people to do that. And um, so I clicked on your, and I, I saw the channel name. I was like, Southern ASMR. I was like, what is, what is that? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> when I clicked on your channel name and I watched some of your videos, I'm sitting there like thinking to myself, why does she look familiar? <laughs> I'm like that's just why I feel like I've seen her somewhere, and then like one night it just all clicked, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, that's that's Mary." <laughs> yeah, and um, so, and then what was funny though is um, you know, before before all the you know like the realization of of who you are and everything, I was watching I think it was one of your librarian videos, mm -hmm. and um, like. I had researched, I just Googled ASMR because I, you know, I couldn't figure out what that was in your uh, channel name. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I, I, you know, went down the rabbit hole, so uh, to speak, yeah. and found out, you know, a lot of, of, of about what it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I watched one of your videos, and I mean, sure enough, like, like those books with the... Um, 
uh, like the cellophane wrappers or whatever, like those uh-huh, the, like old the protectors. Covers. Yeah, yeah. The, the crackling of that when you'd open them up real slow and all that. I mean, it was just almost talking about it right now is, yeah. is almost kind of doing it to mm-hmm. me a little bit. And uh, it's, uh, and I'm, you know, like growing up as a kid and everything, I, I didn't really, uh, you know, I would experience it, but I thought I was just like weird or something, you know. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know, just like, um, you know, I, I couldn't explain it. I didn't yeah. really, I didn't realize it was a thing. Didn't, didn't know that, you know, certain sounds would trigger it or mm-hmm. certain watching people do certain things or yeah. whatever. It's, uh, and I never really, um, I know a lot of people apparently get a lot of relaxation out of it and like go to sleep with it and right. whatever like that. Well, you know, I always sort of thought it was just weird. So I tried to avoid <laughs> it, I guess. So I think, I think a lot of people have like different experiences with ASMR and, you know, especially if you try to describe it to somebody and then they think like, you know, what, what's wrong with you? And so it's like, okay, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I went through. The few times I tried to explain it to people and nobody, I don't know anybody else in my immediate, like in my family or in my life that has experienced it. Like if I try to explain the channel to them, what I do, they don't, they don't know what I'm talking about. It's like, well, that's great, but I don't really get it, but that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, uh, opened my eyes to a, to a whole new world and everything. And, uh, you know, now it's kind of fun, you know, when you watch those videos, just yeah. all the, like the tinglies and, mm-hmm. and, you know, the, um, the, I guess, you know, now that I've sort of, um, realized sort of what it is I, I it is kind of more relaxing to me mm-hmm. now than what it used to be yeah. you know but it, it's uh <laughs> it's funny i enjoy it and i'm i guess i'm just weird and i like this sort of thing uh, or whatever but weird. it's I, it's I think, it fascinates me <laughs> i think there are a lot of people out there that would agree it's it's not weird it's wonderful i mean i wish everybody could experience it i think the world would be a better place <laughs> probably so if we all had asmr but fortunately no <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, you mentioned the accents video. Um, yeah, I did watch that, mm-hmm. and that's something that's always um, intrigued me. Yeah. You know, of course, I don't hear my own accent as much as oh yeah, I don't hear mine either. as much as apparently I have because <laughs> I've been told that you know I'm, I'm mine's pretty thick and. Really, I've watched videos like my mom and has took of me when I was a kid, and I I was I had way more of an accent then mm-hmm. than I do now, um, but. Yeah, you were mentioning like you sort of think accents are kind of disappearing to mm-hmm. a degree. And I think, yeah, it's it's not like everybody, but I've noticed that a lot of younger people just, I don't know, they don't sound like people from their area. It's just kind of sad. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, I don't know if it's a cultural thing or, you know, like if it's sort of being taught in schools to, you know, maybe try to... Um, sweep it under the rug or, you know, try to cover it up or whatever. But for, for, and I may be, you know, an, an exception in this rule, but like really, if, if anything, my accent has probably helped me out in life, if, if anything, because, um, you know, in, with what I do playing music and uh, building the instruments, um, I've actually done, you know, because I'm in this, this world, I've, I've been fortunate enough to do quite a bit of traveling. I've, I've been to the UK like six or seven times and, and France and Canada and, and all, all because of music related, mm-hmm. you know, trips. And, um, you know, people love it. Like the, the oh. Appalachia accent and <laughs> yeah. stuff like, like if anything, it has gotten me ahead in life in, in this sort of area or, or in this type of field. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other thing is too, I just like accents, you know, yeah. I, I like, um, you know, I like different, I, I like, you know, people of different cultures and that sort of thing. It's, mm-hmm. it fascinates me to, uh, you know, to experience that and to hear it. Oh, and, yeah. and it's just cool. You know, it's something that, um you know, just makes people unique. And, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I know, I know for me, it's, it's, it's always been, uh, you know, people would, would talk to me. I, or so I've been told people would talk to me just to hear, just to keep yeah. me talking. Oh, I've you know. had that. Yeah. When I, I lived in Illinois for about a year in my twenties and people would just stop. And like, if I was in a store and they heard me talk and they would just stop and <laughs> stare like I was this exotic bird or something. Like, exactly. Wow. Where are you from? You know? Yeah. What are you talking about? And when I came back, I said, I got to go. You know, I got to go back where people don't have accents. Exactly. Like everybody up here Ex- talks weird. <laughs> exactly. Sorry. All, all about perspective. That's that? right. But, yeah, but, but you know, it. like like in, in our area here, you know, air is a location. 
you know, down air, up air, down over air, air, over air, you know, that, that sort there. of thing, you yeah. know, so. And we know. take one syllable words and turn them into two that's, syllable Oh, words. yeah, that's no problem at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can hear a difference, like, from here compared to where I grew up. I grew up kind of south of Greensboro mm-hmm. in North Carolina, and I can hear a difference between there and here, like a, oh, a yeah. pretty big Mm-hmm. difference like just mainly just certain words are just pronounced differently yeah i do too um i'm i'm just north of mount airy north carolina right across the the virginia state line mm-hmm. and um yeah I, even if you go i live right at the foot of the blue ridge mountains um and if you go just like nine miles north of here um and and get on and, and top the mountain up like around hills one stuff you know you can definitely hear the difference mm-hmm. in the accents even there um and it's um yeah I, I don't know i don't know what it is i i've got a um like i've got a best friend and he and his wife have a son and it's amazing how thick his accent is really? and his wife is from from down around my area we probably grew up maybe five miles from each other or so the way the mm-hmm. crow flies and and he grew up on top of the mountain and they have this kid who was raised down here and his accent is <laughs> I, I mean it's bound to be thicker than mine i mean oh, it sound it reminds me of my old videos when mm-hmm. i was a kid and the funny thing is neither one of them talk like he does really no That's and weird. it's like neither of them have an accent that thick at all and it's hmm. just amazing to me um, you know, it just fascinates me how, mm-hmm. I guess it's in the water or something. So. I don't know because <laughs> I, there is no logic to why he would sound the way he does. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's something he'll, it'll change. Like, you know, cause I, I have some home video of me when I was about 12 and my accent is a lot worse, which I know a lot of people are like, how could it be any more, like how could <laughs> exactly. it be any stronger than it is now? But it really is. Um, and I, I don't know somehow just over time, I guess it just, changes somehow i guess so the people you're around i think for kids today a lot of it is just they watch so much of the internet they watch a lot of youtube videos and they i guess they just hear you know and, and people maybe they want to be like they want to idolize or whatever whether they realize it or not they just kind of subconsciously talk copy the way that person talks mm-hmm. and most people don't talk like we do so <laughs> yeah that's true yeah it's, and you know it's funny too um like when, when I have traveled to the UK or, or places sort of farther off, um, like, you know, when you fly into an airport like um, London Gatwick or, or something like that, you know, where a lot where they see a lot of, uh, you know, the world's mm-hmm. travelers come through, even um, I've been stopped even there before by, by other folks, the locals, <laughs> and, you know, they're like, we have never heard your accent before. Really? And, uh, and you know, I've, because, you know, it's happened so many times, I sort of got to, to pondering on, on that. And, you know, in, in our area, like in southern Appalachia area, you know, it's never been known for like a, you know, a riches, you know, not, not that many wealthy people right. are probably, you know, there's not a lot of money in this, mm-hmm. probably in the southern Appalachia area. Right. And, you know, most of the, probably as far as uh, Americans go, like um, the world's view of Americans is probably mostly those from New York, Miami, yeah. L.A., mm-hmm. you know, your big, you know, Chicago and, and places that, so. you know, have a lot of money that can travel. So mm-hmm. when someone like me that's coming out of the hollers of, <laughs> of Virginia, you know, comes comes to the airport talking the way I do, I mean, you know, it, it does catch a lot of people off guard. And, and I've got to thinking, you know, it's probably simply because not that many people from this area have ever went that far away, maybe short of mm-hmm. military experiences right. or, or that sort of thing. And and maybe that's partly due to why the culture is sort of maybe stayed a little bit, you know, because it's yeah. there's not, um, I don't think maybe as many people know about the area to a degree, you know, and, and there's not um, a lot of... Not, not a huge economic draw for people to move here right, and that sort true. of thing. So yeah. I I wonder if that's sort of maybe the reason that it's been, you know, somewhat kept, you know, uh, pure and maybe the accents are sort of still alive yeah. in, in this area and that sort of thing. So I just hope the Internet doesn't kill it. I mean, I just think that would be a shame to lose it because, I mean, yeah. you know, Internet is pretty much everybody can, you know, access that. But um, do people ever try to guess where you're from, like when they hear you talk? Yeah, and, and most are shocked when I say Virginia, because oh, yeah. most, um, 
probably a lot of people think of Virginia as like the D.C. area, Arlington, you know. Right. I can, yeah. The, I kind of do too, even though I spend a lot of time in this part of the state. But still, if you were to say Virginia to me, that's what I would right. kind of think about. Yeah. And, and my mind is couldn't be farther from the truth. You know, really, I'm probably... I have grew up more in North Carolina, you know, like uh, we always joke where I only live like a mile from the state line. Mm -hmm. And uh, we always joke that we pay our taxes in Virginia and live in Mount Airy, you know, (laughs) or or North Carolina or Uh whatever, you know. And uh, so, um, you know, probably a pretty good representation, uh, believe it or not, of, um, you know, accents and, and somewhat the culture of this area would be the Andy Griffith Show. Yeah, I I've, mean, it's not a far cry from the uh-huh. truth, folks. I, I've mentioned that to some people in a couple of videos that, you know, people want to know. You know, Andy Griffith grew up in Mount Airy, mm-hmm. and that's where the name of the, the town, Mayberry, I believe mm-hmm. it came from that because it, it sounds like Mount Airy, Mayberry, and he grew up not far from here at all. And the way he sounds, especially in the earlier seasons, it mm-hmm. seems like he sounds a little different to me when it, when they went into color. Yeah. His accent kind of changed a little bit. It seemed like he was mad all the time. Right, <laughs> He was yeah. grouchy and sounded like he was from Indiana or something. <laughs> but the early, the black and white episodes of the Andy Griffith Show is a really good example of what people here sound like. Yeah, I agree. grew up in this area. And, and like, especially like the mountain folks, like the... Um, uh, the Dillards and the Ernest T. Bass. Is it, is it the Dillards? Is that who it was on the, <laughs> the show? Or is... um, the Darlings. Darlings. Okay, the Dillards is actually who did the singing for them. Oh, really? Yeah, and that was a, a you know a old an old band. Okay. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, the Darlings. And, <laughs> I haven't uh, thought about them in a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I know people like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, you know, sort of, sort of along the, the ballpark of that. But you don't have any Ernest T. Basses up here. They, oh, there's a few. Oh, no. They just might look a little different these mm. days. Oh, my <laughs> but word. there's a few. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, it's it's. I'm I feel very fortunate to have grown up in this part of the the country i think mm-hmm. um but most people when they try to guess where i'm from they say texas right which, but then I'm i could thinking, see that a little i guess maybe maybe more people from texas people with southern accents maybe from that area travel more or probably they're more present on tv or something or i would say a so. lot of people think i'm from texas and i'm like no people from texas don't sound like me right my experience i mean time i've spent in texas they don't they don't sound like me mm I mean, I, I like the way they sound, but they are, it's different down there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we got some instruments here. I'm like, this is a mandolin. Uh-huh. Right? This is a, the, it is, this is a, an, an F style mandolin. Um, it's a, F stands for Florentine. This is, this mandolin is uh, pretty much made sort of like a copy of a 1920s uh, Gibson uh, mandolin. And um, the F styles have this uh, scroll here and these uh, these points. And there's another style that's called an A style. And it's essentially just this same mandolin, just minus the points and the scrolls. And Does that make it sound different, the way it's made? <clears throat> you know, there's theories about that. Um, this is pretty much solid. It's pretty cool because I have one here with no top or back on it. <laughs> so you can see this This is called a neck block uh, right right there. And so this those little points and um, and, and the scroll area is, is pretty much all solid. Um, but some people... They have a theory that because that's solid, it stiffens the top up a little bit more because there's more, um, you know, the t- the top is glued to more of, of something. You mm-hmm. know, it's just not kind of open. It's, and some people think that has a, an effect on the way they sound. Okay. Sound chamber-wise, like just, just this area that would be inside this circle I'm sort of drawing, that's really, really identical between the two. Hmm. Um but this is, uh, you know, in bluegrass and, and mountain music, you know, Bill Monroe is, is sort of the father of bluegrass. And this is the style of mandolin that he played. So this is sort of like the, you know, what everybody, you know, wants to be seen with. You know, uh, A styles are getting more popular, you know, but, um, but everybody always likes the Fs. And, mm-hmm. you know, they are kind of cool looking. They got a lot of, have a lot of character. Yeah, uh, it does. The wood that it's made out of is curly maple. Uh, the, it's uh, the back, sides, and neck are all curly maple, and the top is spruce. Um, 
and this is a red spruce and the cool thing about that is it grows in Virginia so we can actually pretty much all the wood that it takes to build a mandolin you can you can get from Virginia oh nice but it has to be above like 5,000 foot elevation or something like that really because <clears throat> you know like um like when we were kids and they showed us like tree growth rings and stuff like mm -hmm. that well you know every year the tree grows it makes another ring mm -hmm. and well if the tree grows less the rings are tighter together right. and the rings are those are those grain lines okay. so the less it grows every year the stronger the wood actually is wow and they can't even really see it but they are super close together yep like um yeah, you can just barely see. Yeah, I didn't you know, even know that's what that was. That is those rings. Wow. But what it is, is you're looking at, like, if you if you were to take that that big, let's see if I can get this to sit down here, that big ring, like, if we were looking at it like this with the, you know, with the circles going like that, mm -hmm. and you were to flip it up this way and, and put it back here, that's that's the the log that's okay. the direction that that this is this is getting cut from well that was a huge tree then i mean because they look oh, yeah. they look straight like they're not curved at all no and that's called quarter song when the grain is like running straight up and down um mm -hmm. and not kind of like sideways i'm sure i probably have some pieces laying around here we could if we really wanted to geek out <laughs> about it i suppose <laughs> that is so cool how long would it take to make something like this an f style like this it would take me probably you know five or six weeks you know a good good month and a half or so to make some i'm actually making three at one time right now which is the first first time i've ever tried to bite off that much so <laughs> we'll see if i have any hair left when uh <laughs> when this is going or if, mm -hmm. or if all my hair is gray or whatever <laughs> so um, that's actually what this is right here it like is that's the, the that's the, the starting of one of those it is this is the well let's see here's one that even has a little less work done to it this is just the just the sides mm -hmm. and the the neck and block and the and the tail block and then the two little the points there so this form just holds it in shape so it retains that shape right so do you just leave it in there until it's like dry like yep. the wood is dry i leave it in the form until i glue the top on that that'll be the okay. next thing um well after after this stage you you glue this uh, this is called a uh, curving uh, these little slotted um, mm -hmm. bands that go around the sides what that's for is just to give the top and the backs a little extra glue and surface to adhere to because okay. um, you can see the sides are so thin that just wouldn't hardly be anything there to glue uh, to yeah. so you put that on there to just to have a little extra um, hmm. you know something for the glue to hold on to the next thing here would be to glue the top on and once you get the top glued on, you can take it out of the form then. It'll it'll hold its shape, you know, pretty well at that point. I don't know if you can point. see the, oh, I don't want to pop it out of the frame. But that, so this is called curfing? That's correct. Curfing. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> oh, no, you won't mess it up. It's it's pretty uh, it's pretty safe in, in, at this point. <laughs> so how did you get started making because it's, it's we were talking earlier about how rare it is to find someone who who is a musician and also makes instruments how did you get started doing that well i was i was there goes my pick um <laughs> i was a musician first my dad got me started playing mandolin he he played fiddle and my mom sang and mm -hmm. um, my family actually had like a little uh, gospel band that would go around and play in churches and and some little community and events and stuff like that mm -hmm. and I was um, probably 12, yeah, maybe 12, 11 or 12 years old, and I met these two guys named Wayne Henderson and Gerald Anderson at the Galax Old Fiddlers Convention. And uh, Galax, Virginia is only like 16 or 17 miles from me, and it just so happens that the world's largest Fiddlers Convention takes place there wow. uh, every summer in August. Mm -hmm. um, and I met Wayne and Gerald up there, and um, both of those guys are like really renowned instrument makers. Um, you know, they're they're known pretty much worldwide. Um, there was actually a book wrote about Wayne called Clapton's Guitar, mm -hmm. and this was um, uh, Wayne made Eric Clapton a guitar. Um, well, both of those guys are super down to earth fellas, and they they always have a heart for like kids that are learning to play the music and carrying on like the Appalachia oh, old time yeah. bluegrassy like music from this area. Mm -hmm. So they would always make a big deal over you or something. If they were playing, they'd get you up on stage with them and play oh, a tune and cool. stuff like that. So always, always uh, made you feel, you know, really great. Um, and 
I got to be good friends with uh, with Gerald, and my dad hired Gerald to make me a mandolin when I was like 12 years old, and um, <clears throat> and I always stayed in touch with him over the years. You know, we we sort of always kind of had a common bond, and and we're sort of friends. And I and I was you know much younger at the time. I was probably 13, 14 that time, uh, or around that age, and when. I think I was about 19 years old. I had my my mandolin in a soft case, like one of those gig bags we we call them. Mm-hmm. Not a hard, not a good hard shell case. And I dropped it, and it broke the oh. broke the neck in it. Mm-hmm. As you can see on on this mandolin here, the neck, the the head in here kind of angles angles yeah. downward like that. Well, I dropped it straight down like oh, this, no. and it snapped that thing up straight like oh. that. So I very shamefully had to carry it back to Gerald, <laughs> and. Um, have him put a, another neck on it oh. and repair work is pretty low on the totem pole for most of us we mm-hmm. you know we hate to even deal with repair work we'd much rather build new stuff right and um so it sat around Gerald's shop for for quite a while probably i don't know six or eight months or so well, in the meantime, on my 20th birthday, I wrecked a motorcycle and I broke like four <laughs> bones in my foot. Never broke a bone in my, oh, wow. in my life. And on, on, I really made up for lost time that day. Mm-hmm. And, um, so, um, I had to have surgery on my, on my foot and everything that kept me out of work. At the time I was a, um, I, I worked at a truck garage and salvage yard, like tractor and trailers and that sort of thing, family business. And, um, after I got out of the hospital and all, they, they had me on crutches and, and that sort of thing. And it was my left foot. And I got to thinking, I was like, oh, I'm just sitting around here at the house watching, you know, TV and that sort mm-hmm. of thing. I, I wonder if I could call Gerald up and see if I could come up and maybe just help him sand or something on that yeah. man on or whatever. So I uh, called him up and sure enough, he didn't, he didn't mind for me to. And, um, and like I said, I broke my left foot so I could still drive an automatic vehicle. So I got in my mom's minivan and I drove up (laughs) there about an hour away from here or so. And I would, uh, and I started hanging out up at Gerald and Wayne's shop and I've always, you know, worked with my hands. That's, that's sort of been the story of my life, you know, Mm -hmm. um, doing mechanic and work or like woodwork or whatever. And, um, so I, I kind of took to the instrument making part of it up there and, and Gerald saw potential in me and, and thought, uh, you know, that I could, you know, do okay at it and everything. And, and eventually, um, I wound up, um, starting to build instruments full time in 2005. Oh, wow. So, and Gerald and I had a shop together in a business and, and we still, uh, in 2010, I moved back uh, here to, uh, the Lambsburg kind of area and that, and, started my own shop but I still do a lot of work with Gerald Mm -hmm. and um so yeah that was um I had to break a lot of things it seemed like but uh (laughs) well it worked out pretty well in the end yeah yeah I guess it did (laughs) and I I know um was it two summers ago you worked with my cousin's son I did and he made a guitar here he did yep and uh, i remember uh he was so proud of that and I that really was appreciate pretty cool you doing that. yeah you're you're very that was pretty interesting he uh there was some video game or something that he liked to play and we actually took a, a character out of the video game and inlaid that in the headstock oh, of the guitar I, I didn't get to see it oh yeah, yeah i didn't get to see it but yeah it I, was like some night or, or something like that oh, but, okay yeah, yeah he he was real proud of that it yeah. was, it turned out good. He did a good uh, did a great job on it, and uh, I remember yeah, him was... talking about how much sand in there was. Oh, and yeah. He said, "I don't want to sand anymore." Yeah, there's. I said, there's you no, got to keep going. <laughs> there's no shortage of that for sure. Just when you think you're done, there's plenty more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that was that was really really nice of you to do that. Well, it was uh, it was certainly a favor to to Jack. You know, he's mm-hmm. he's been extremely good to me, and always. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here that that has his name wrote all over it that he's <laughs> that he's rigged up for me and oh. helped help me in my uh, um instrument making so well he was yeah. he was really happy that you did that too he thought that was great <laughs> yeah it was it was my pleasure <laughs> yeah it was um, awesome um so um i know you've made instruments for a lot of different people um mm-hmm. who all have you made instruments for well, a lot, most of mine are somewhat local, but I do ship, you know, all over the, the country. Um, but I guess the most famous person that I had a hand in making one for was Dolly Parton. Mm-hmm. Um, we, um, 
we were fortunate enough, uh, Gerald and Wayne and myself and another really good friend of ours who also makes instruments, um, whose name's Jimmy Edmonds, um, we have a little band. We call ourselves the Virginia Luthiers. Um, uh, a luthier is a person who builds instruments. And and if you're getting all technical about it, um, luthery is the craft of instrument making. Oh, okay. So a luthery or luthery is the craft, and a luthier is the is the guy doing it. So we call ourselves the Virginia Luthiers, uh-huh. and um, we. Uh, got the opportunity to to play on this album called um, uh, the 1927 uh, Bristol Sessions Revisited or Orthophonic Joy I think yeah it starts starts out Orthophonic Joy the 1927 Bristol Sessions Revisited and what that was um, the <clears throat> the the 27 Bristol Sessions was a series of recordings that essentially launched country music mm-hmm. there was um, a guy that came down from New York that worked for RCA Records and he was hired to capture the music of this area mm-hmm. and that's where the Carter family got their start okay. um, let's see I think uh, Jimmy Rogers like a lot of the pioneering mm-hmm. country music folks was, was featured on these things well there was a, a producer in Nashville that wanted to recreate these this 1927 Bristol um, recording sessions or at least pay tribute to them Mm -hmm. and take a lot of those same songs and use today's artists to recut them and we were uh, fortunately we were uh, invited to be a part of that and also Dolly Parton was was going to be on it too Hmm. and we were hired uh, they they found out we were instrument makers and everything and we were hired to uh, Gerald and I to make a guitar to to gift as a gift to Dolly by mm-hmm. by other people for uh, for her participating in this uh, recording. So oh, so nice. she didn't really like place the order herself, but as far as I know, she you know still has the guitar, and I've yeah. got my you know picture made with her with it and all that oh, sort of wow. stuff. So that that's pretty cool. That's that's I guess that's my biggest claim to fame. Oh, that's wonderful. But, but other than that, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of good local musicians that's got mm-hmm. instruments of mine, and they're they're all over the place. You know, Florida and you know, New York, and just all around. You actually delivered one to the UK, didn't you? I did. I heard that you. Yep, I have two of them over there. Okay. Yep, two instruments, and one in France. There's a mandolin there. I've I've been to I've been to where all those instruments live. <laughs> <laughs> that's so. that's great. Yeah, I think they they wanted you to deliver it and yeah so. yeah we we brought it over and uh, and had a had a good time. They always take good care of you and that sort of mm-hmm. thing. So it's a uh, yeah this you know the the instrument making and and music. It's really um you know I've got to see a lot of the world that I probably would have never you know seen yeah. had I been you know doing took another path with my life Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's that's been pretty cool yeah well that's awesome oh so um so much stuff to cover here i know (laughs) i know it's wow so this this is actually did you make this right here i did that's uh that is actually my personal guitar um i've not um let's see i guess they probably can't see it too well for the microphone there can they yeah sorry Um, about that (laughs) this is uh i i had this one together about a year ago and i've still not finished it for myself you know you don't really get paid for the ones you keep you know yeah that's Uh, true they don't pay as well what what is that mother of pearl? Right it there? is, or, wow. or abalone. Uh, oh, okay. Mother of pearl is white, and the uh-huh. abalone it, it still comes from a shell, you know, okay. the ocean and all that. But it's the all colored, That's colored pretty. up stuff, and yeah, real wild looking. Is that the the thinner strip here though? That's is that? How do you do that? Um, it's it's inlaid in the top. That's oh, actually really? a channel that is cut inside the top, and wow. and all that stuff is is placed in and glued in. Oh yeah, up here you can see where it. Yep. comes together where the where the joint is and the fingerboard from the neck will cover all that so right. so the joint don't have to be you know absolutely perfect there so this actually has has your name on it it does <laughs> yeah my um, my instruments are, are called Strickland Strickland mandolins and guitars so is this and, is this wood? It is. That really? is really. It's it, almost like plastic. Yeah, it's very thin and very hard. That's Indian rosewood, and oh, wow. rosewoods are real hard woods. Huh. Um, and and that that is pearl in in that one. That you oh, see how okay. white it is. Yeah, I noticed that. Um, th- is that also? It is mother of pearl. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Do you yeah. do you make these or 
Yeah, those are, um, yeah, you cut them out and, mm-hmm. and thin them down and everything. Now, I actually, I'm hiring out, uh, I'm, I've got a friend of mine who's cutting the inlays for me on a CNC machine nowadays. Oh, okay. Now, I used to, I sat down and freehanded all that out with a router. Really? And you did, so you would cut out? Yeah, you'd lay a, lay wow. that name on there. And I have some, some pieces of just, just the pearl over there, just my names. How little that is. And you would, um, you'd <laughs> trace... Imagine lay the name on there and trace it out with a pencil and then drop a router in there with a little tiny like one thirty second inch bit mm. and just freehand it out like sort of color between the lines so to speak and mm. and and i you know i and i can do that and but i've got a a good friend who's getting into this sort of thing so mm-hmm. i'm i'm letting him do that work for me oh, now okay. and he's he does an excellent job That's... with it and uh, and it you know, it's a time-consuming thing that, you know, you you don't really feel like you've accomplished very much when all you've done <laughs> is put that name in that one little piece of, a, of wood. Um, awesome. So it's kind of nice that it speeds you up a little bit. But, I mean, it's easy to get a close to an hour tied up in something like that. Oh, and I, all you've done is put a name in a piece yeah. of wood, you know. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. But this is some really wild looking stuff. If you notice, it's got all these kind of like crazy, yeah, it's crazy like wavy. curls. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's called bear claw. And not all spruce will have this. Um, but this piece here is a really exceptional piece. Um, I don't know if I can, I might be able to get it in the camera in, in some sort of way that yeah. you can start seeing some of that like wavy like stuff. The, yeah. Um, how, how do you find would what has to happen to it to make it look like that that's a really good question and i've asked a lot of people that harvest this stuff that and i don't think they really know okay you don't really know what you've got until you until you cut into it okay and uh not a you know that's not a really common thing but that one has real intense bear claw going on in it it does and the the sides in the back is is mahogany but it's curly mahogany you can see uh, all the, the little t- stripes like a, yeah going, going and, the, and this is inlay also that is this is actually three pieces you got the two pieces of the back and mm-hmm. then the one uh the one back stripe there that's wow. glued to it Okay. And the top's two pieces, too. It's just there's no decorative um, stripe going down the center of it, though. Mm-hmm. But you can hear, you know, like when you, uh, you know, just tapping on it and stuff like, like that. You know, Yeah, it really <laughs> has a has a lot of... That one, I think it's going to sound really great. It's got a lot of ring to it. You know, you kind of uh-huh. listen for the sustain. You're like, you know, how it long it kind of carries out. on out. And, and that I think that usually translates to a, to a great sounding mm-hmm. instrument. Mm-hmm amazing i'm gonna actually do a separate video where we're gonna walk around and look at some other stuff but um before we go is there something that you would like to, to sure play? yeah well, um, you, oh there's my pick i know i dropped it there a little bit i ago. like the fact that you play so many different types of things that's really cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i was uh i'm sort of i'm i'm sort of um sporadic i guess or uh <laughs> What random? I guess you're like you can call a, you're it. Your shuffle, I guess. Exactly. Yeah, I can just go go from uh, you know just all sorts of. Um, yeah. You know, just nice Appalachian stuff, or if you uh, if you want some oldies music. Guns and Roses. <laughs> Never heard that played on a mandolin. <laughs> Not many people have. What's the point? You know, <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Dude. Um, let's see. I can play. Uh, I can play like a little song I wrote. Okay. Um, this is a uh, kind of a probably about the only slow slow ish song i've ever uh, ever tackled but you know the beatles had a song years ago um as my guitar gently weeps or, mm-hmm. and uh so i sort of got my inspiration off that title a little bit and i sort of always thought this tune sort of sounded kind of happy and up you know upbeat or whatever so i called this tune the happy mandolin so <laughs>
awesome. A little bit That's of a really con good. condensed version there. Uh -huh. That's amazing. How long did it take you to learn to play like that well i still am oh <laughs> to be honest it's a never-ending process <laughs> exactly yeah um but i've i started when i was like almost 10 years old mm -hmm. and i'm uh almost 35 now so i'm looking at about 25 years doing this <laughs> oh, wow. you should be a lot better than i am but oh, at I, this point you i think, think it's great <laughs> i think that's great um There's some beautiful inlay there yeah well, this um, is that abalone abalone it is uh and this mandolin was made by the guy that taught me how to build mandolins this is this was made by gerald anderson in 1998 and yeah gerald would have would have inlaid that the hard way like we were talking about and he probably cut all of his pearl and, and everything too and, and inlaid it down in there hmm. and um the the nut this little area that the the strings run across uh, that's made out of bone like cow bone and that's supposed to be like you know as good of a material as any to make them to make them sound good hmm. a lot of your cheaper guitars and or instruments in general they'll use plastic for for yeah. this and it it doesn't uh, i think it absorbs too much of the string sound or vibrations or something mm -hmm. the bone really just lets it ring um and this hmm. fingerboard is ebony that comes from from africa and there's no stain or anything on that that wood it's That's, really that dark it is it's that dark all the way through wow uh, the sawdust and everything that uh it looks like you've been working in a coal mine when you <laughs> when you've been sanding on that oh, stuff a wow. whole lot or working on your car your fingers I are bet. just black and covered in dust and mm -hmm. everything if you <laughs> if you um start sneezing and everything your 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 kleenexes come out black and it's <laughs> oh, just uh, <laughs> yeah it's uh it's wow. a, it's a messy um huh. but it's really uh real hard wood uh, mm -hmm. it wears good like lots over if you look at some really old instruments lots of times you'll see like grooves just wore down in the in the fingerboard between the frets oh, yeah. the frets are those little metal mm -hmm. uh bars running sideways there um and that's just from where like people's fingernails and stuff just, just wore into the into, into the yeah yeah that's uh, awesome sometimes if they get bad enough you actually have to replace the fingerboards and, mm -hmm. Um, so what what kind of wood I think you said earlier what kind of wood is the t was the top again the top is spruce, spruce okay. um, and th in particular this is red spruce or Adirondack spruce they like to they like to call it mm -hmm. um, and then the back sides and neck are curly maple curly maple okay and a, a mandolin is a really close relative to a violin the, mm -hmm. they're tuned exactly the same they note out the same the only difference is a mandolin has two of, of every string you i can, was noticing that yeah, and yeah. they're they're identical you can see it's they're the, same. the exact same string and uh whereas a violin would only have one mm -hmm. and obviously you play the violin with a bow yeah. when you pick a mandolin but um i had a lot of people ask me why they why you think they put two of every string and i don't really know the the you know the real answer but my best guess would be uh is just to make the instrument louder you know it's it's kind of a small instrument it's not not big at all mm -hmm. so for it to keep up with like maybe a guitar or a banjo or you know fiddles are pretty loud you know for it yeah. to, for it to be able to kind of hang with uh you know other louder instruments mm -hmm. i think they just doubled up the strings okay. and um just help essentially should have come close to doubling the volume mm -hmm. um the only downside to having two of every string is you you really got to keep them both tuned you know tuned together oh, really close yeah. or instead of like a instead of it sounding like that it sounds like this mm. <laughs> and it makes it a yeah you don't know way though i bet if you fiddle the a little bit you can get an interesting you, sound from it there are folks that um that do that they'll kind of play with tunings Just, yeah. and they'll tune it to like harmony notes and stuff like that mm -hmm. um on a mandolin they're strung so tight that lots of times you start asking for broke strings and <laughs> stuff like yeah. that it gets it gets tricky depending on you know where you're trying to go with it mm -hmm. uh, but yeah they're um they're interesting instruments you know i think uh, you're you're hearing a lot more of them nowadays like in country and uh you know paul mccartney released the song a few years ago and i remember seeing the music video and he was playing a mandolin oh really yeah so so maybe they're maybe they're making a big cultural comeback sort of like maybe the ukulele so. did there a while back you know everybody <laughs> started playing ukuleles for... tiptoeing through the tulips <laughs> that's it yeah <laughs> yeah well i think it's a beautiful instrument i think it, it's 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 aesthetically very very beautiful and the music is is beautiful too 
Well, I appreciate it's it. Really yeah, nice. it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. This is it's it's been a pleasure. You know, uh, who knew who knew we would be here like this? I, so. I would have never thought. <laughs> I, I do have a, a channel too. Um, uh-huh. yep. Just um, I think it's if you just search Spencer Strickland. I've I've never um, it was my original YouTube channel. I never really got all fancy mm-hmm. like you have and yeah. uh, and and gave it a you know a good name and everything. Maybe I should get around to doing that at some point. But well, I'll put a link in the description to it as well. Oh, that'd, that'd be so, great. But yeah. if if you like to, you know, most of the time when I just string up these instruments, I'll make little review videos talking about, you know, what what's unique about this particular one, and I'll play a song or two mm-hmm. on it so you can kind of hear what it sounds like. So it's nothing nothing terribly exciting, but if you enjoy <laughs> instruments and, and listening to the way I talk, then, then it would be your kind of thing. Yeah. All right. So. Well, great. That's wonderful. But thank you so much, guys, for watching, and I hope that you have a great day, and I'll see you later.